Thank you, Evan Sue, and Laura, and Kevin, and everyone. It's beautiful to be back here. And uh, we have a lot of varied and technical greetings in Jewish tradition. Uh, you can say, if it's your Sabbath, you can say Shabbat Shalom. You can try that. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs> or you can try Moadim Simcha, Chagim Uzmanim Sasson. Uh, I brought some uh, props for the Jewish holiday this week, Sukkot, the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booths, uh, a lulav, an etrog, branches, an etrog, citron fruit that is this morning at seven in the morning on Zoom with my friends in Israel. And I was shaking the lulav in six directions and sending out these prayers for peace in all directions. And here with you now in this moment, to reflect on, to try to embody something in Hebrew we call chonen, or chanun. That is also translated as grace. What is grace? We in Jewish tradition like to answer questions with more questions. <laughs> this time I'll give you some answers, and you'll help me with them. Maybe we can remember them together. So, the first question, what is the cost of grace? And the answer, nothing. What's the cost of grace? Nothing. Nothing. Second question, what's the key to grace? The key to grace. The answer, trust. What's the key to grace? Trust. What's the cost of great? Uh, nothing. nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here's the challenging one. What's the path to grace? The path to grace, Sabbath. What's the cost of grace? Nothing. What's the key? <laughs> nothing. Nothing. If you just stayed silent, you would have got the right answer. What's the key to grace? Trust. And what's the path to grace? Sabbath. Yeah. If you just remember that and listen to more of Laura singing, you'll be fine. <laughs> Yesterday, Laura took me up to a, a retreat center, a meditation retreat center in, near Ward. And um, Neither of us had been there before. I was sort of invited on a whim. You know, they were very excited. Rabbi Jamie's coming. And, you know, I figured I'd get the kind of reception there that I get here when I come. Oh, Rabbi Jamie, well, so glad you're here and so welcome. I walk in there and nobody even turns her head and looks at me. I walk through. I throw a frisbee. Nobody bothers to ask my name. I go into the room. No, everybody's ignoring me. I'm like, dang, what am I doing here? And then I confronted my expectations, the story I was telling myself. You know, these were mostly 20-somethings. There were probably a couple dozen, 30 people, 40 people maybe, young people. They were just doing their own thing. I'm old. I don't know who am I, relevant, you know. Um, you know, I had my guitar. I'm here ready to, you know, lighten up the place with some music. And I was just a fly on the wall. And I was upset. I was, what am I doing, right? What's going on? Why am I so, mm, I feel like I'm in high school and like on the out of the group, you know, the in group. And, and then I remembered the chapter on grace. And there's a passage from, the, from Psikta, a, a rabbinic commentary that says, when you with a human king or ruler, you go with hands full and you leave empty. With God, you go with empty hands and you leave full. The beautiful meditation that you guided us in about this being a place for emptying. How do we empty our hearts, our minds from our story. The story that, oh, I'm going to this new retreat center, it's a meditation, this is my like wheelhouse and I'm ignored, right? 
what expectations did I have? I did not expect to be a fly on the wall. And I thought, hey, I could be a fly on the wall. How often I wanted to be a fly on the wall. <laughs> when I let go of that expectation, it just turned, right? Oh, I just get to watch. How often do you get to see? You know, it's like when my kids were teenagers, you know, and driving, and then they forget that I'm in the car, and they start talking, and you're like, I love this, right? You can actually hear what they're thinking and feeling, right? They don't talk to you if they know you're paying attention. <laughs> so there was no cost. And actually, the only way to access grace in that moment was to offer nothing. I felt myself saying, hey, would you like me to do something? I just, uh, I brought nothing, and I tried to let go of my expectations. What's the cost of grace? Nothing. 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 <sighs> and the key? trust. So God tries to teach Moses this. After already being in the desert for a while, but it didn't go great. Moses, look at these beautiful commandments. Go down and bring them to the people. Moses goes down. There's a golden calf. Moses smashes the tablets. Trust is broken. There's nothing, right? What am I here for? What am I doing? What's the point Moses is asking? If I'm going to keep going this, if I'm going to get this people to the promised land, I need some help. I need, I need some guidance. I need you. I need to know you're there. God, show me your presence. Show me your glory. And God says, what was the cost of grace? Yeah, God basically says nothing. You can't, you can't see me. You're human. You can't see me and live. I can't show you my grace. Oh. But here's what I can do. Now, this sounds nice at first, but when I was reading it again last night, I'm like, oh, damn. <laughs> I'm going to put you, Moses, in the cleft of a rock. In other words, between a rock and a hard place. And then I'm going to let my goodness pass by you. In other words, you don't get any. And then I'll remove my hand. And then you can glimpse my after effects. Some rabbis translate it as my backside. <laughs> How do you get grace? How do you build trust? You have to practice it. Where do you practice it? When you get stuck between a rock and a hard place and all that you thought was good, all that you thought was just, all that you thought was fair is just gone. Goes by you. Misses you. Then I'll take away the blinders and you'll be able to see I was there all along. But not in the moment. And then God says, I'll do one more thing. I will teach you a name. yud Hey vav Hey, Hebrew letters. In Jewish tradition, we don't pronounce it, right? You can't see my face, and you can't even say my name. But then I'll teach you what the name means. In 13 more names, I told you we have complicated greetings, we have complicated names for God. 13 more names, Adonai, Adonai, El Rachum, Bechanun. We just had our high holiday season, Yom Kippur, our Day of Atonement. We traditionally chant this over and over, apparently to remind God, remember you said you were gracious and forgiving. <laughs> remember, <laughs> right? So this is the name, the 13 attributes of God, Shlosh Yisraeli Dot Hashem, that this book is based on. So number five is grace, Chanun. Okay, so that becomes Moses' key, and I think it's actually the Ten Commandments clear that they didn't work. Let's try these qualities of attributes of divinity. 
All right? That's the response. There's another piece of grace, and that is getting to the third piece. What was the path of grace? Sabbath. Sabbath. So Sabbath in Jewish tradition. In uh, Jesus talks about why worry? What, what's worry going to add to your lifespan? Right? In Taoism, they say, Lao Tzu, be the Tao. Get out of the way. Go with the flow. Buddhism is pretty much all about grace. Four noble truths. One of my teachers, Sylvia Burstein, we call them her a, a Jubu. <laughs> There's a lot of Jubus. I'm a former Jubu myself. She has a teaching that I thought of um, about 15 years ago. I had a really bad snowboarding accident right into a tree. Um, took one, you know, feel down my boot and realized several fractures, right? Buckled my boot back up. My son waved down the ski patrol. I'm not going anywhere. Waiting for the ski patrol. I get down Winter Park into the um, they take x-rays, and the doctor comes out, and he says to me, how come you're not screaming in pain? My kneecap was shattered, my tib-fib was broken, right? And I said, and I quoted Sylvia Burstein, I said, pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. I can't control that that tree jumped right in my way. <laughs> what I can, re can control is my relationship to my pain. The Israelites had been enslaved for 400 years in Egypt, generations. The first piece of spiritual technology that they're given after crossing the sea, dancing and celebrating their freedom. Anyone know what it was? What's the path of grace? Sabbath. Sabbath. Before you even get to Mount Sinai, before you even receive the Ten Commandments, which includes Shabbat and all three different versions of the Ten Commandments. Yeah, there are lots of versions of the Ten Commandments. And actually, nowhere in the Torah does it say they are actually commandments. Ten utterances, speeches, never commandments. Anyway, before you get to Mount Sinai, you have three months of journeying between the wilderness, between the crossing the sea and getting to Mount Sinai and receiving the Torah, receiving the wisdom before, long before Moses has that encounter with God and receives the names of God, the 13 names of God. So. How, mo how is God going to train this community, a mixed multitude of pe different races and religions, all who were enslaved by Egypt because that was the only place there was food? How are you going to get them to experience freedom and grace? So here's what the plan was. You don't have any food. Every morning, when you get up in the morning, there will be a layer, a dewy layer of frosted flakes <laughs> on the ground. That's breakfast and lunch and dinner. Send a representative from your household to collect as much mana as your family needs for that day. No more. I know this is a really breaching a Jewish long cultural tradition. No leftovers. <laughs> no hoarding. You have to trust. You have to trust that tomorrow there will be food there again. And if you do take too much and try to hoard leftovers, it'll go spoiled. It'll go rotten, wormy. You do that for six days, sorry, five days. Go out in the morning, collect enough for your household, just enough for your household, no leftovers. You eat that that day, the next morning you'll do the same thing. You'll go out, 
I promise you, Frosted Flakes will be right there again. You can, right, collect it in. On Friday, on the sixth day, you are to collect a double portion for your family. Collect enough for that day and collect enough for the following day. Because on the seventh day, there won't be any. And every Friday, there will be a miracle. The leftovers that you took, the second portion that you took on that Friday, will be there and not go bad, not go rotten, so that you can eat it the following day. For six days, collect. Sixth day, you collect double. The, second, the seventh day, don't go collecting anything. Just be. Just eat what's already there. And do that for 40 years, and by then maybe you'll learn how to trust. <laughs> this is the message of the story. The mana from heaven is the practice every day of learning to trust, of bringing trust in the face of fear and worry and anxiety that there won't be enough. That's essentially the only thing we worry about, that there won't be enough. Rami talks about the word want, having two meanings, right? Want is to desire, but want is also to sense lack, to feel a lack. Adonai ro'i lo echzar, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And the study we'll talk about, we'll look at the Psalm 23 as a meditation on grace. So what was the key to grace? Trust. trust. And what's the pathway to trust and grace? That's the one anyway prescribed for the former slaves, the Hebrews leaving Egypt, 40 years, and only through that practice can they be weaned from a slavery mentality. Can they wean, be weaned from the sense of depravity and scarcity that has dominated their life for generations? Can they be weaned from the fear that is preventing them from experienced trust and grace? Hmm, there was one more story I wanted to tell. Ah. There's another thing besides worry that gets in the way of grace. He saves it for the last chapter, and he records a, a story there that I want to tell and leave you with. I want, and it's sort of a meditation. I want you to imagine, if you want, you can close your eyes, that you're in a canoe. And you're, the lake is calm, it's beautiful, it's a perfect temperature, the scenery is serene, and slowly a bit of fog comes in. And you think, well, this might turn to some bad weather, maybe I should head back. You start heading back to your safe harbor. You notice that there's another canoe seems to be wanting to go in the same direction. Doesn't bother you at first. Oh, that should be fine. And then it gets closer, and the fog gets thicker. You can see that there's a canoe there, but you can't see much else. And you start to get worried. What, what's going to happen? Are we going to bang into each other? Sure enough, the other canoe bangs into your canoe. And at first you're just startled and a little bit annoyed and, and then it happens again. And you, you notice, and this is a Ram, Rami Shapiro phrase, frustration arising. And then it happens again. And then you notice anger arising. And then the canoe bangs into your canoe harder even than the first. Keeps banging into your canoe again and again. And you notice the anger turning into rage. And then the fog lifts. And you realize the other canoe is empty. 
and all the rage, all the anger evaporates with the fog. So why is that? Why did the anger, which suddenly seems so justified and so real, disappear? You can open your eyes now if you want. When you noticed the canoe was empty, so the teaching he relates is that that kind of anger requires us to assume that we're the target of someone else's ire, God's, right? Think of the stories of Job. This is, what, why would you do this to me? How could this happen to me? That we put a target on our own back. And with, if, we, if we can not do that, there's no reason for anger. Because the world is as it is. The canoe wasn't banging unto you on purpose. The world isn't bringing illness and sadness and death and breakup and hardship on purpose. It's not targeting you. Right? So Rami's definition of grace. Right, to, to see the world and embrace the world as it is without wishing it were other than it is. It's not that we shouldn't have worry. Worry is beneficial. But we shouldn't do it seven days a week, 24 hours a day. We should at least have one day off of worry. And the same goes for anger. The root of anger is perceiving unfairness and injustice in the world or in our lives if we're making ourselves the target. But we should practice a reprieve from worry and anger so we can receive grace. And the key to grace is? And the cost of grace is? And the path to grace is? Thank you.